The Complete Photographs of Darwin by John Van Wyne. This is an extract from the iconography of Darwin in Darwin, a Companion from 2021, with many additions, corrections, and 520 illustrations. The rest of the iconography, or catalogue of over 1,000 unique Darwin portraits, including 210 oil paintings, watercolours, drawings, more than 600 printed portraits, as well as caricatures, and over 240 three-dimensional works, such as statues, busts, and medallions, and iconographies of HMS Beagle, Downhouse, and Emma Darwin is in the book. This is by far the most complete and accurate catalog of photographs of Darwin ever published. It includes a dozen discovered during the many years of research for this study. The list includes more details about each photograph than previously published, such as dates, prices, the photographers, and comments by Darwin's or others on how the photographs were originally received. And, unprecedentedly, it includes details of all known variants produced to the early 20th century, more than 340 of them. This is how Darwin's appearance became so well known to the public during the 19th century and after. It is well known that Darwin declined a request to be photographed with A.R. Wallace to illustrate a German translation of the 1858 Linnaean papers. Darwin replied that Meyer was welcome to include a photograph, but I am not willing to sit on purpose. It is what I hate doing and wastes a whole day owing to my weak health, and to sit with another person would cause still more trouble and delay. P.S. I am very sorry to be so disobliging about the photographs, but I cannot endure the thought of sitting again, and I have refused three or four photographers lately. Wallace agreed, as he wrote to Darwin on the 4th of December. It is, of course, out of the question our meeting to be photographed together, as Mr. Meyer coolly proposes. Darwin's son, Francis, later recalled, He certainly had a great regard for time, and speaks in some of his letters with disgust of losing a day, I think one about being photographed. Despite Darwin's oft-expressed aversion to sitting for photographs, this catalogue reveals that from 1865 he would be photographed every year or alternate year for the remainder of his life, except for perhaps 1875 to 77. It was common practice at the time to sit for a more up-to-date photograph to send to friends and correspondents. Comparison, Emma Darwin was photographed much less. A list of all known photographs and portraits of her are listed in a separate iconography in Darwin, a companion. Most of the photographs of Darwin were eventually commercially available and also reproduced as engravings or woodcuts. Francis Darwin recalled, He did not realize that people would know him from his photograph and I can remember him at the Crystal Palace Aquarium saying in uneasy voice that somebody had been looking at him and he supposed he must have been recognized. Dating Victorian photographs is particularly difficult as they were almost never dated at the time. They were often reproduced for many years by the same photographic company and also pirated by others, but differently cropped and edited. Attention to tiny clues can help narrow the possible date ranges. The many variants in the Darwin photographs represent separate orders by photographers to keep copies in stock for sale. Hundreds of thousands of photographs were produced in the 19th century and even more in the first decades of the 20th century. One popular card alone of topical interest sold over 250,000 copies. By mid-century, new technologies made large-scale reproduction of photographs possible for the first time in the form of small cartes de visite, which are 11.4 by 6.3 centimeters, the size of a formal visiting card. Paper manufacturers produced card blanks in mass numbers, and these were sold to retailers. Professional photographers or photograph publishers would order blank card stock and, as the century progressed, have these printed with their name or address in increasingly ornate designs and advertisements. One could pay for one's own portrait to be made, and photographers also sold portraits of famous persons. Albums began to be produced to store collections of these small portrait cards. From the early 1870s, a larger format called a cabinet card, 10.8 by 16.5 centimeters, replaced the earlier 
and smaller carte de visite. Many traditionally accepted dates for Darwin's photographs derive from much later annotations on some copies. Some of these are clearly very inaccurate. Also, for decades, Darwin's dress was invariably very similar with a double-breasted waistcoat, often with a similar spotted design, a silk cravat and heavy, loose, dark jacket of plain weave. Of the photographs that reveal this, only Claudette, 1842, Wallach, 1871, and Raylander, 1871 A to B, show him wearing a single-breasted waistcoat. The latter two are so similar that they might even be the same suit. His personal appearance was also very consistent after the 1860s, with a mostly bald head and full bushy white beard. A 30th of May 1935 letter from his son Leonard Darwin in the Robert M. Stecker collection at Case Western Reserve University, accompanying an autographed copy of Raylander 1871D.1, states, I think the photo was taken somewhere about 1870, but this is a mere guess. He always looked old for his age. It might be rather later. Louisa Amity Nash, a neighbor and friend of the Darwins at Down, recalled, Those eyebrows used to trouble his wife when his photograph was taken. She used to say the photographers gave him no eyes at all. Some of the dates adopted here might be further revised in future, and there are probably further exposures from sittings already known. Details are given below for each photograph and the various printings or variants that were produced, or rather those that have been seen so far. We have no idea how large the print runs were. Nevertheless, this reveals much about the extent to which Darwin's image was circulated, in what forms, and which photographs were most popular in different periods. Such details will also be of interest to collectors. A careful reading of the list will make it clear that many errors about dates and photographers have gone unnoticed for many years in the literature on Darwin, and some may still remain in the present list. Of all those whose records have been found, Julia Margaret Cameron was the most active in registering photographs of Darwin for copyright. There was a rush by some photographers to register their photographs of Darwin for copyright shortly after his death. The first time, so far as seen, each photograph was engraved is noted to illustrate when a particular likeness became widely reproduced and available in print. Jean Kritsky has for many years been collecting and studying photographs of Darwin. He has discovered many photographs and likely some not recorded here. His findings are to be much anticipated. A note on signed Darwin photographs. Darwin and his family distributed hundreds and perhaps thousands of photographs of Darwin during and after his lifetime. Darwin signed very many of these, as was common practice at the time. However, as is explained below, commercial Victorian carte de visites and cabinet cards were routinely printed with a facsimile lithographed signature of a famous sitter. The high quality of this facsimiles have fooled many. One recent writer has opined, there are signed cabinet cards in the market, but just about all of them are forgeries. A genuine signed photograph is a rarity. There are many Elliot and Fry cabinet cards in the market with a forgery placed at the bottom of the card. There are also many of these same cards that feature a facsimile signature. Caution is warranted. The sad fact is, if you see a Darwin signature in the market, it is very likely a forgery. Very many Victorian photographs had the name of the sitter written on them by a previous owner. These were not meant to be forgeries, just to identify the sitter. That is the introduction to the list of Darwin photographs provided on Darwin Online. The remainder of the very lengthy page consists of detailed entries about each photograph and the photographers and so on. Those will not be read in this audio recording, which aims only to make the audio of the introduction available.